What you do today can change the world around you. That's what our kids are going to be learning this week. We, you've seen some of us wearing these t-shirts. This is our kids' crew shirt for the weekend. We're going to be teaching them how to make waves, and we all want to make waves in our life, and so I just wanted to give an additional plug for VBS. We just are so excited about this week. And also, hey, if it's your first time with us, uh, whether it's your first time you're, you're dialed in online right now or you're here in the room, there's a Connect card in your back pocket, back seat pocket, not in your back pocket. That would be weird. <laughs> Some kind of magic trick. You're like, oh my gosh, where'd that, how'd that get there? <laughs> this is a weird church. <laughs> uh, but there is a Connect card in your seat back pocket uh, where you can fill that out. We want to help you take your next step, and you can do that on our website as well if you're online. And so, hey, we are jumping into a new series on brand for our pool party this week called By the Pool. By the Pool. Anybody like to spend some summer days by the pool? That's your, that's your spot. You just like there's something about the tranquility of the water and the silence and a little light desert breeze that just breathes life into you, right? Where you can jump in the pool. Like I think, I think we're at that point now where the pool's getting the right temperature. You know, we're starting to turn that, to turn that uh, corner. And there's just, there's something about it, right? Kristen loves being by the pool. She absolutely, that's her spot. She could just sit by the pool and soak in the rays. And I'm more of an under the shade guy because I have no responsibility about my life. So if I sit out in the sun, I get totally burnt. Uh, so I'm more just like a shade guy. But some of you, there's something about sitting by the pool that just evokes that R&R that you need, right? That rest and relaxation, that refocusing of your mind. You can kind of escape from a busy week. And I don't know if you're like me, but if you're like me, when you're at the pool, by the pool, or you're on vacation, you're, you're removed from the busyness of life, a lot of times that's like, it's kind of like you get the shower thoughts. You know what I mean by the shower thoughts? When you're in the shower, that's when your best ideas are, right? But, but there's nowhere to write them down. Like maybe you can write them on like the uh, like where the where the uh, the door is fogged up, like you could write them there, but like there's nowhere to write them down. But you have your best thoughts. Why? Because you're removed, right? And when you're by the pool, when you're on vacation, a lot of times, if you're like me, you have these dreams that come in your mind. Like you're like, oh man, it would be really cool if our family could be prepared to do this, or man, it would be really cool if our church could do this. And I start to have these different ideas when I'm removed from the busyness of life. I think there's like a, there's like a God-infused rhythm in that. That's, that's a great thing. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. But the problem is when we leave the pool, right? When we walk away from the pool back into our life, those dreams are faced with this horrible thing called reality, right? And all of these idealistic thoughts that we had about our life get crushed by this horrible word called logistics. <laughs> and we just start thinking about all the things it would take to make it happen. And we're like, oh, you know what? And we get to this sense of a breaking point and our excuses become bigger than our dreams. And the tension point I want to take us into today when we talk about what does it look like, what do the moments look like by the pool is are your excuses bigger than your dreams? Are your excuses bigger than your dreams? Now listen, this isn't like a pep rally talk where I'm going to tell you you're all, like I'm not going to turn into mean football coach right now and, and tell you you all just need to try harder and do better and uh, all of that. But there's a reality to this statement that we, we remove ourselves from those moments of dreaming back into reality and our excuses can outweigh our dreams very quickly. It's easy to rationalize not pursuing what God has called us to do, the dreams that are on our hearts, the things that we want to do, because we can't see the reality of it coming to fruition with all the barriers that are in front of us. So we make excuses. We make excuses. And unfortunately, I think a lot of us live in this tension, succumbing to our excuses and pushing aside our dreams, when I actually really don't think that is what God has called you to do. Now, I don't think it looks exactly how 
it looks by the pool all the time. But I think that God wants you to pursue your dreams. And I hope that today we can have a moment by the pool, by the pool. See, Jesus had a moment by the pool in John chapter 5. I hope we can have a moment by the pool this morning that will help us overcome those excuses. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we love you as we jump into your word. Give us an answer. I know that there are some people that are praying big prayers right now. They're praying prayers for their next step vocationally. They're praying prayers for their next step in their family. They're praying prayers for healing. God, and I pray right now that you would give us the grace and the space to be able to hear from you, not from me, but that everyone in this room would hear from you. In Jesus' name, we all said together, amen. Today, we're going to look at a moment Jesus had by the pool, and he met a man who had a big dream, but he also met a man who had some big excuses. Now, there's no fault of his own in these excuses. In a lot of ways, the world that he had found himself positioned in had really fed him these excuses. So what I want to frame as we jump into this message is excuses can sometimes be a super negative thing, and sometimes they can just be the reality of your circumstance. Jesus cares about your excuses. Jesus, unlike, uh, unlike a parent who has a, has a limit like me on how many excuses I can hear, unlike a parent who can reach their limit, he can actually handle all of them. So your excuses and the circumstances that you find yourself in aren't a condemnation on your personal character. And sometimes they're not even your fault. Sometimes it's the hand that you are dealt. In John chapter 5, he meets this man. It says, sometime later, Jesus is walking and talking with his disciples. He went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Verse 2. Now, there in Jerusalem... Near the sheep gate, at uh, near the sheep gate, a pool. Now, this is just a position, place in the city where you enter into. We're not going to get into too many details, but he's just, John's just giving us. This is where he entered, and there was a pool right after you got through the gate that they call the sheep gate. There was a pool nearby it, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida. Bethsaida means house of mercy which in Aramaic was called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. These colonnades were a structure, basically a shade structure, that were surrounding these pools uh, in this place where people would sit in the shade. And these pools were, were known to have or were rumored to have healing power. And what the, what, the, what the story was and what the hope was is that they would have these moments where these pools would be stirred by angels. And what would happen is people would carry lame, someone who was lame, someone who was sick, someone who had an ailment. And when they were stirred by the angels, they would pull them into the pool and they would, that's where they would receive healing. We don't know if it always worked. We don't really know how, what, the, what the percentage of that was, but this is what was happening culturally around them. So it gravitated under these colonnades, under these shade structures, were people who were desperate for healing for a touch from God. And so they're gathered under these colonnades. It says here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. It was the blind, the, the lame, and the paralyzed. They were lying around in these shade structures. Verse 5. One who was there had been invalid, meaning he couldn't mobilize himself. He couldn't move. Some sort of a paral- but he was, he was paralyzed to some degree. Looks like a great degree. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years. Now, I want you to hang out. Hang on to this connection, 38 years. I want you to remember that number, 38 years this man was laying invalid. 38 years he had some sort of rhythm to get under those colonnades to seek healing from these special waters. 38 years. The better part of a a generation. We don't think he was there as a child. So the better part of his life, the majority of his life, he's laying by this pool, not being able to do anything for himself. 
Now, before we go any further, don't ever hear me say in this passage that there was something that this man did specifically that God was punishing him to put him there. There are, there are things that we experience in this life. There is sickness that we experience in this life. There is disability we experience in this life, either by your family or you personally. We all know this to be true. And it's not directly connected to your sin. We live in a broken world. And so we will all probably experience this, if not personally, close to you personally in our lifetime. So this man, laying invalid, had spent 38 years seeking healing from this place. Hang on to that number, 38. In fact, look at somebody next to him and say, 38. 38. Verse 6, it says, When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? I'm not saying that Jesus asked the dumb question here, but like, that's pretty obvious, right? It's pretty odd. Like, do you want to get well? Like, we look at that question, and when I first read that, I'm like, was he being rude? <laughs> like, obviously he wants to get well. Like, was he, was he being snarky? Like, what is his attitude towards asking that question? Do you want to get well? The man is laying here. He's obviously been here for a long time. He's got his spot picked out. He's, he's the regular. But there was probably something about his countenance that it said, I'm here. But I'm, I can't really try to get there anymore. There was probably something about his disposition that said, I'm positioned close to my dreams, but I'm probably never going to get there. I'm positioned close to healing, but I'm probably never going to get there. How many times do we position ourselves to be able to daydream, but we don't really believe? We position ourselves to see what might could be, but... We don't really believe that it could ever come to pass. And I, I think that Jesus peered into this man's soul in this moment. And he asked him a question that the man needed to be asked. Do you want to get well? Because sometimes we can just wallow, right? Do you want to get well? His posture indicated complacency. And he said, sir... The invalid reply, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While, while I'm trying to get in, indicating you could move a little bit, while I'm trying to get in, someone else gets ahead of me. So he has two big excuses here that are actually completely valid. Okay, that no, what, number one, Mr. Jesus man, I don't have anybody to help me get in there. Number two, every time I try, somebody beats me. Every, like, what, what am I supposed to do, man? You say, do, do you want to get healed? Of course I want to get healed. Now, now, I think, like, maybe his response was a little salty. Mine probably would have been, <laughs> right? Like, well, like, yeah, well, I don't have anybody to help me, and somebody always beats me before I get there. So he has these primary excuses. But Jesus looks at him, and here's where I say Jesus can handle your excuses because he sees your value. Jesus can handle your excuses because he made you in his image. Jesus can handle your excuses because your setbacks do not throw him off. And how many times are our excuses, nobody's here to help me. How many times are our excuses, somebody always gets there first. So how many times are our excuses, man, if somebody would help me the way that they help that person, then I would be able to have a leg up. Man, if somebody would put me in the game, if somebody would give me the promotion, if somebody, would, if somebody else would help me, then I could get where I need to go. And that's what he tells Jesus. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. It's very important that we notice in this moment that Jesus doesn't take him to the pool. You see, a lot of us think we need another opportunity, and what you really need is an encounter. You don't, you don't need another opportunity. You don't need, some, you don't need something to be handed to you. You need an experience. You need an encounter with Jesus. You need a moment with the one who created you to show you your next step. 
Because inside of our excuses is self-reliance and self-dependence. Inside of our excuses is this need to be our own hero. And when he experienced Jesus, Jesus didn't drag him to the pool. Jesus didn't say, hey, your excuses are invalid. Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. I want to take us into a moment. You remember that number I told you earlier. That number was 38. 38 years this man had been sitting by the pool making excuses. And here's where I want to take us. Here's where I want to take us in this moment, because 1,500 years prior, there's a book called Deuteronomy. God's people had been led out of captivity, million people led out of captivity by Moses. They were in captivity with, under the Egyptians, and God said, I'm going to deliver you into a promised land. You're going to encounter enemies, but I'm going to help you overtake them, yeah, and I'm going to deliver you there. So in, on their way, God literally parts an entire sea, and they walk through it. Like, this is some crazy stuff that happens. He parts the sea. They walk through the sea. And then their enemies are coming behind them. And he closes the sea on the enemies. And they're, and they're walking to, their, to the promised land. And they can almost see Canaan in the distance, their promised land. They can see it in the distance. And they get to this place called the Zered Valley. And, and when they get to this place called the Zered Valley, here's what they do. They all huddle up. And they're like, all right, here's, here's the plan. We're going to send some spies over into the promised land to see what we're dealing with. We're going to see what we're up against. So God is telling them to go into this promised land. He's telling them to cross this big valley. He's giving them a big dream. He's giving them a big promise. And on their way, they, go, they send some spies over into the promised land. And these spies, they come back and they're like, these guys, they're called the Amorites and they're pretty stout. Like, they, they, they got a lot going for them. They, they're pretty strong. They've got weapons. They've got structure. They've got a city. Like, and here's what the mighty men of Israel did. The warriors positioned to fight the battle that God had sent them into. They said, man, God just delivered us out of Egypt to kill us by the hands of the Amorites. Very quickly, their excuses became bigger than their dreams. Right when they saw opposition that they felt like they couldn't, they couldn't overtake in their own strength. They gave up. And so God said, he said, there's one man, his name's Caleb, and he, I can see that he has faith. But as for the rest of you, you will die off and you will not see the promised land. It'll be an entire generation that will not see this land. Huge moment in the life of God's people. And so here's what happened. 38 years later, they'd been wandering around the wilderness in their excuses for 38 years. And what did the Lord say? 38 years. They'd been wandering around and the Lord said, now, get up. Get up and cross the Zered Valley. So we crossed the Zered Valley. 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we saw the Zered Valley. By then, the entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp as the Lord has sworn to them. How long would you allow your excuses to be bigger than your dreams? How long would we allow that? Because here's the reality. We can sit on our recliner and let the time pass by. We can, we can t continue to seek moments that just give us life and us life only. But if we do not take the dreams that God has put in our heart by the handlebars and take the steps that he's given us to take, he will pass an entire generation. God's purposes and promises are not contingent on the obedience of this generation. He will accomplish them. He will accomplish them. It's do we want to join it? <laughs> do we want to join his activity? Do we want to see his movement? He's capable. He's moving. He's here. But do we want to get up? 
Do we want to get up and take hold of what he's put in front of us? Do we want to walk into the promised land? Do we want to see thousands of people come to faith in this valley? Do we want to see generations be changed by the life of an experience with Jesus? Or are we just going to talk about missed opportunities? The life of God's people is marked by an experience and an obedience. Here's the, cool, here's the, here's the interesting thing about the Christian life. Galatians 6 says that we should bear one another's burdens as we, as in, when we bear one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ, which is beautiful, right? Like you got problems, I got problems, we all got problems, you know, so like we're going to talk about our problems <laughs> and we bear one another's burdens, we help each other get through hard times, right? This is good, but anybody feel like you ever like somebody sharing with you and you're like, look, I got my own problems, <laughs> Somebody like is getting to that point where it's just like they're taking more life from the circle than they're giving to the life, right? And, and it's like, look, I got my own problems. Like, you think you're the only one with problems? Like, and let me tell you what I got going on, right? We get in those moments. There, here's the tension of the Christian life. In that passage in Galatians 6, it says, but bear one another's burdens. And when you do that, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. But here's what it also says. Now, each of you should carry his own load. There's something that you were designed to carry. There is a load that your shoulders were built for. And the tension of walking in community is understanding that I have people that want to help bear my burdens, but I, the, part of them bearing my burdens is helping me be positioned to carry my load. Does that make sense? Part of them bearing my burdens is not me just being this leech of a friend that has no purpose other than to suck the life from someone else. Like, you're like, get off of me, right? No, no, don't, don't be that. Be somebody who allows somebody to help you bear your burden so that you can be positioned to carry the load that God created you to carry. That's why he looked at his people. After 38 years of wandering in the wilderness, wallowing in their own excuses, and what did he say? Now, get up. Get up and go cross the valley. Get up and go fight the battle. Get up and go pick up a sword. Get up. Get up and pick up your mat and walk away. Get up. Don't miss the period of 38 years where we are seeing over and over again with God's people that he will allow a whole generation to pass by. When we say, you know what, my excuses really outweigh the cost of my dreams. My excuses really totally outweigh the cost of my dreams. 2.15, Deuteronomy 2.15 said in regards to that generation, the Lord's hand was against them until he had completely eliminated them from the camp. I don't want to be eliminated. I want to be empowered. I want to walk in the purposes that God gives us, even when we send spies out. And like, that's going to be impossible. There's no way we can do that. We're in the middle of the desert in a very unreached city. There's no way God's going to grow a new church here. We're, hey, no, 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 we're, it's too hard. You know, we got like COVID and, and stuff. And so like, God's not like, let's just wait. Let's just allow our excuses to become bigger than the dreams he's put on our heart. No, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not about that. We'll never be about that. Because God wants to empower a generation of people to accomplish purposes they were designed to carry for his glory. That's what we're about. That's good. We can clap. There was a starter golf clap in there. Let's go ahead and build it up. He's totally okay with that. So will we be a generation that says yes, even when the odds are against us? Will we be a generation that says yes, even when we face opposition? Will we be a generation that listens to the word of God and depends on the power of God? So he looked at that man. And he said, get up. He didn't just say get up. He said, get up and take your mat. Get up. Take your mat. Why? Because now you are healed to carry that mat. 
You are healed to walk in your purpose. You don't have to depend on somebody else to drag you into the pool because you've had an encounter and experience with Jesus. This is not about not needing community. This is about the the load God has called you to carry and praying that he would eliminate those excuses so that you can walk in that purpose. Is your, and so at once, verse 9, at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. He picked up his mat and he walked. So I want to ask us this question as the band comes up and we prepare to close. Is your life marked by experiences with Jesus or excuses you make to Jesus? Maybe you need to write that question down and go to the Lord with it this, this week. Because there's a lot to process there, right? You're like, oh man, I'm going between this, this like seesaw in my mind of like, I feel so bad. and Oh, but I have so many dreams. And listen, God wants to comfort you in this season. He wants to put his arms around you. He wants to move you forward. But we have to ask ourselves this hard question. Is your life marked by your experiences with Jesus? Because listen, this man didn't do anything magical to heal himself. This man laying by the pool was positioned there and he was met by Jesus. And so you know what he told people? He didn't tell people he got in the pool. He told people he met Jesus. And he wants to walk with you and he wants to empower you. But we have to ask ourselves this question. Is your life marked by the experiences with Jesus or excuses you make to Jesus? Are we going to be a generation that's marked by our excuses or our experience? I want to be marked by our experience. Experiences with Jesus. You may want to write these down. They won't be on the screen, but listen fast. Experiences with Jesus start with faith. Excuses start with fear. Experiences with Jesus continue with steps while excuses will tell you to stop. Experiences with Jesus will finish with fruit. Excuses will finish with regret. And listen, I just want to throw this out because maybe your maybe your dream is that God would use you in your vocation. Maybe your dream is that God would turn your family in a new direction spiritually. Maybe your your dream is that you would find somebody to spend the rest of your life with. And God's giving you some steps. You may not like them. They may not be super fun. They may be super practical. It's going to be the hard, small steps of faithfulness that lead to the fruit. And I would just ask you, when it comes to the next step God's calling you to take, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? been given into your excuses too long they're not getting us anywhere what do you have to lose take the step here's three points of application write these down or take a picture of the screen number one start with a faith filled prayer pray a prayer to God that only he can answer don't pray prayers that you can answer Pray a prayer to God that only you, he can answer. That he coming alongside you will empower you to accomplish. Number two, obey with your next step. Sometimes the complexities of the future can just overwhelm us for the present. Take your next step. Number three, expect God to bring the fruit. Expect it. Expected. I quoted this verse earlier, Philippians 1, verse 6. He who started a good work in you will bring it to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. He finished what's he start, what he starts. He's good. So let's commit today to living our lives. We're seeking to have an experience with God. Let's stop making excuses, start taking steps. 
don't stop one inch short of the life God called you to live. Let's bow our heads across the room. Hey, if you today, you're like, man, you know what? Just in this moment of prayer, just with God, if you would say, I don't know Jesus, we want to help you know Jesus. We want to take you to that place. We want to introduce you. You're like, I got excuses, but I've never had an experience. I've never had an experience with Jesus. We want to help you take that next step. Myself and some other leaders, we're going to be in the back of the room as soon as we close this song, or as soon as we start this song. We're going to be in the back of the room. Everybody's going to stand up, and that's your cue. You want an experience with Jesus today. You need prayer about something today. As soon as we stand up, your cue is to walk to the back of the room. Walk to the back of the room. And we want to introduce you to Jesus. We want to pray with you. We want to walk with you in this next season. Let me pray over you, and we'll worship Jesus. We love you with all of our hearts. We ask that you would just continue to meet us here, right here in this moment. As we give you our best in the close of this moment. Settle and steady our hearts right now. To receive your word. To make a move for you. Maybe the first step of obedience you are calling someone to make right now is I need to get my relationship right with God. So God, I pray that you would give that person the courage in this moment as soon as everyone stands to their feet for them to walk to the back so they can get to know Jesus. Give them the courage right now in this moment. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody stand and let's continue to worship.